Okay, thank you. Okay, and they start counting now. <laughs> okay, I was going to make a presentation that was uh, much more objective about uh, equality and politics, but I was told by Philip Rowe that no, what they were interested in was a very personal account of, of personal experiences. So I will be talking about uh, personal experiences. But first, I'd like to say that private ownership and the market by themselves may produce great restaurants or wonderful computers, but they do not produce great cities. Cities are community products, and governments, regardless of whether we like them or not, are the best representation for communities. Even kings or sultans did. Adam Smith taught us how wonderful it was that selfish interests produce the best for all because each person trying to become richer produce the best products at the lowest cost. But what is good for the bee, what Adam Smith said, is not necessarily correct in cities. For example, each person in a selfish way, may want, everybody may want to use his private car. But if everybody uses them at the same time, the city may collapse. And clearly we cannot let developers do whatever they want with land. If it was for private interest, maybe there would not be even public space for streets, much less for parks or, or for anything. So they clearly, cities is an area in society where regardless of our belief in the efficiency of the market, we need a lot of intervention. The market by itself. I also, as I was, was, was told to say a private thing, in a couple of weeks, I will receive this Gothenburg Award for Sustainable Development. Uh, for things that I did in, as a mayor, but actually I never tried to do sustainable development when I was mayor. What I was trying to do was to, to, do, to create equity, social equity and quality of life. And what is surprising is that there is no contradiction. But not only there is not a contradiction, but the same policies apply. When we are talking here about walking and cycling and busways, we did these things not because we were trying to create sustainability, but because we were trying to create equity. And it's good to mention here that Colombia and Bogota has about half the income per capita of Istanbul, about, but still, it would take us, if we grow very fast, maybe a five, six percent annually in Colombia, more than a hundred years to reach what is today London's income per capita. Not to catch up to London, but to reach what is today London's income. So it's inter important for Istanbul or for India or for any city to, to, to really be careful not to try to copy technologies that are not related. We wanted quality pedestrian spaces in order to improve people's lives for equality's sakes, to show respect for human dignity. Sustainability, I would say, begins with social sustainability, with equity and democracy. Every I don't know the Turkish constitution, but I am sure the first article in the Turkish constitution, as in any other constitution, says that all citizens are equal before the law. And a consequence of that is that public good prevails over private interest. This is not just poetry. If public good prevails over private interest, for example, there should not be private waterfronts, especially not around in urban areas. This is democracy. This is not communism. If public good prevails over private interest, for example, a bus with 100 people has a right to 100 times more road space than a car with one person. This is, and also, I would say we cannot have equality today in the market economy, but we can have equality of quality of life, at least for children. But seeking the public good, as I am going to tell you, is very painful and very difficult, as we are going to try to do for a, for a government. Children, children, we have to seek quality, equality, maybe not of income, but equality of quality of life for children, that all children should have the same possibility of realizing their potential, of being happy. Children need great nurseries, schools, parks, libraries, sports facilities, and this is not things that the private sector is going to provide. Government is needed to provide all these things. So we build lots, hundreds of children's nurseries, schools, great. Now Bogota, not only my administration, but others, we have maybe 150 great schools in the poorest neighborhoods and slums. But if we invest in roads like this and we forget the slums, we are not going to achieve these things. So we, you have to 
If you want to build great libraries and schools and parks, perhaps you have to cut a little bit in the main uh, thing that absorbs government money in developing cities, which is road infrastructure. So you can build great schools, libraries. These library systems, for example, which we built, now we are taking almost 500,000 people every month. Uh, and all of these things were possible because we decided, instead of making giant road infrastructure to restrict car use, and instead to invest in housing, schools, parks, and the like. Uh, there are other things in which the market does not work well. Clearly, we have slums everywhere in the planet, uh, in developing world. It's not because all mayors are stupid. It's impossible all over the world. It's clearly because the system does not work. Private property and the market do not work well in the case of land around growing cities. When prices go up, it's not as in the tomato production. The, 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 the supply of land does not increase, and so the market does not work. So you, there has to be, in order for environmental reasons. This is in Bogotá. You would imagine Bogotá is very hilly. No, Bogotá has hundreds of thousands of hectares, of flat hectares, but this is in private hands, such as this. So clearly the market does not work. This is why countries such as in Sweden or in Finland, all land around growing cities belongs to government. Here I heard in Turkey, most land belongs to government around the cities. But unfortunately also sometimes private pressures end up making this government land being managed almost as if it were private land. So we made this kind of, uh, I think we have to buy land around the cities, do great urban design, and only then private builders can be great building homes, but not in generally doing great urbanism. This is the types of things that were done. Private pressures not only have problems for low-income housing, also they create these type of things, the low-density environments, which of course is terrible for, for energy consumption, for transport, for quality of life. But uh, why, why do we have these things? It was because there was a great plan in the United States to produce suburbs? No, it was because every time there was a traffic jam, they went and made bigger roads. If we do that, sooner or later we will end up with this. Even in Europe, where they have the best land use controls in the planet, they ended up to a large extent after the World War II with similar things, maybe not so bad as this. So density is the most important element of good transport. But upper income citizens are going to these things all over the developing world. Happily, not so much in Istanbul. Why do they go there? Istanbul has a wonderful density. Why haven't they had more suburbs? Thanks not to great planning, perhaps, but more to traffic jams. They are the most useful tool to create density. There are more intelligent ways to achieve that, but that's a useful one. This is what we have in Bogota. Why do people use public transport there in Bogota? Is it because they love public transport or the environment? No, for the same reason they use it in London or Manhattan, because they have to because it's quicker or cheaper or something like this. Why do people go to the suburbs? It's not because they are stupid. It's because they see green or places for their children to ride bicycles. So I think it's possible to achieve higher densities and provide the same things people are seeking in the suburbs. A lot of green, safe spaces for, people to, for children to play. For example, I would see Central Park as a vaccine against suburbanization. This thing, by the way, was created when New York was in around 1860, when New York was much poorer than any developing country city today. And we are not doing, unfortunately, much of this. This in Bogota, see how similar it is, huh? except this is a country club in a highly dense area. So, it, <laughs> so we started to, uh, the effort to turn this into a public park, the most exclusive country club in the city. Very painful, very difficult. We only achieved to turn the polo fields into a public park. But this is the type of fight that you have to do if you have democracy. It's very difficult. So you have parks, parks again, and plazas here. These things are necessary. This is not some sort of, it's as necessary. If we think plain is unnecessary, it's, not, it's as necessary as schools or hospitals or roads. I'd like you to see this picture. This is a, the same picture as the next one we are going to see. This is the space for children. This is what we did. And this is this, the same picture, the space for cars. 
Look, the faithful children and the sidewalks, what do you do first? I would love to do both, but if you don't have enough money, public space is a government product, again. Like this, uh, JICA, the Japanese agency, had proposed, the cooperation agency which proposes highways and subways all over the planet, uh, had proposed an eight-lane highway. We did a 35-kilometer greenway linking some of the poorest to the richest areas in the city of Bogotá. And tens of thousands of people ride to bicycles. We also did another project which is interesting, a 24-kilometer pedestrian and bicycle street through the poorest areas of the city where the city was going to grow. The, the citizens did not want it initially because they preferred the traditional paving of the streets. So we had to do a lot of communication and talking to communities. And they, it transformed their lives because it showed respect for the human dignity. They feel important. It's a, even underground cables, 24 kilometers. Now the city is all around it, except once you are not a mayor, it's hard to get into a helicopter. It's a 24 kilometer pedestrian street, and I think this is the kind of thing now that the city is growing around it. Look at the car in the mud, and then next to it, the fancy pedestrian street. Of course, in these low income neighborhoods, 99% of the people don't have cars, but it's a different way of conserving cities. But this is not just for the poor, this is in Germany. I think anybody here's life would be greatly better if a few blocks from their home they could enter a 100 or 200 kilometer network of pedestrian and bicycle streets only, just to sit, to ride a bicycle, to read. It's a radically different way of organizing a city. And it's very simple. And it's very difficult, perhaps in New York or Paris, but it's very easy in the new areas uh, cities where the new cities are growing, such as in developing countries, in India, in Kenya, we could have hundreds, thousands of kilometers of this with completely useful for mobility, for quality of life, for everything. And it's just a matter of political decision and a little imagination of things, doing cities different than have been done before. This is again in Munster, in Germany. Quality sidewalks or pavements. I don't know how they call them in here. I would say that's the most, what really makes a difference between an advanced and a backward city is not highways. Even in the poorest African cities where they don't even have water, they have highways. What really makes a difference between an advanced and a backward city is, if we are talking in terms of infrastructure, is quality sidewalks. But low-income people are not even conscious they have a right to this. Like this is in India or in Kenya. They are not even conscious they have this right on the country. The upper income people who have the, they are the owners of the television stations, the newspaper, they can convince the poor that to make a great highway is great progress, even when they don't have a place to walk. So it's very difficult for a politician to fight for these things, especially because most of the time you have to get cars out of here. For example, here, we went yesterday from here to the restaurant all along the, the waterfront, like uh, 15 kilometers. And first of all, it's sad that we have a, such a high velocity road next to the waterfront, but worse that there were cars parked all along the waterfront, 15 kilometers all along from here to the restaurant we went. It was called, uh, well, whatever, Said Halim Pasha Yalishi, or I don't know how to say it. So, this is lack of democracy. This is what it shows that citizens with cars are first class citizens and those who walk are third class citizens. I was almost impeached for doing this kind of thing, getting cars out of sidewalks. We had many advertising, uh, we told in TV, for example, just as people cannot, we had this, uh, we don't have time because, but showing, just as cars, as people cannot be in the middle of the street, we had some people playing cards in the middle of the road and hey, having a traffic jam. Cars cannot be in the space for, of people. We also taught people that Sidewalks are not relatives of streets. They are not for going from one place to another. They are relatives of parks. And so it is absurd, it's just as absurd to say that you can uh, park, have a parking bay as well as have enough space for people to walk by as it would be to say that you could turn the main park or plaza in a city into an open-air parking lot so long as you leave enough space between cars for people to walk by. My team, I mean, I was almost impeached in this process. It was very painful. My team told me we should let go. 
We even had to send my 12-year-old daughter abroad because it was such a horrible environment. The whole city was, because the upper-income people were against that, only 22% of homes in Bogota have cars, but they have all the power. So it was extremely difficult. But this is the kind of thing that is painful at first, but people will love it in the end. So this is the kind of cycles that we did. We also told them, I mean, parking is not a constitutional right. Governments have many obligations. Governments have to provide it roads, education, hospitals. <laughs> anyway, let's go quickly. Shopping malls are a big problem because, of course, shopping malls in our... I mean, why such a perfect weather such as Istanbul? We have shopping malls, gate, closed shopping malls. They are almost clubs designed for upper-income people and middle classes so that low-income people feel uncomfortable. They are almost clubs. When people are in public space, they are all meet as equals. The, the shopping mall is designed to make poor people feel inferior, to be, feel in, uncomfortable. Let's go quickly, because I don't have enough time. Quickly, waterfronts. These were the waterfronts of before democracy. See these walls there? Now you have these wonderful waterfronts, and that's the future, but let's go quickly. Clearly, we are not going to solve traffic jams making bigger roads. In the United States, traffic jams are increasing in every city in the United States, despite giant highways, because it is not the number of cars, but also is the number of trips and the length of trips. So clearly, this is not a solution. I'm not going to have enough time, but nowhere in the planet do you know one city where traffic has been solved making bigger roads? So clearly, this doesn't happen anywhere. So the only solution is public transport. But it's important to understand, I mean, by the way, one of the reasons why Manhattan has most of the people using public transport is because there is very little access. This is a great advantage because you don't have, so this is what you have in Istanbul. So you may do one or two or three or more bridges, but still I would say not having many access is an advantage rather than a problem. The same as in Manhattan. Long time ago they decided they would not make any more bridges. Uh, but let's go very quickly. Uh, there is no such a thing as a natural level of car use in a city. If you make more space for cars, there would be more cars. If there was more space for cars in London, there would be more cars in London. If there was less space, there would be less cars. Look at this. Do you think it's because some uh, transport engineer gave them permission to do so? And so, just to finish, I don't have time to go into anything else. Just to show, this is the... London has 1,800 kilometers of rail. 1,800. It's like from here to Athens or something like this. And still they move one million more passengers by bus than by rail. You can do more uh, subways if you want. It's extremely expensive to build and it's extremely expensive to operate. London subway, the cheapest fare is about $4 and it can go up to almost $10. And it has a $14 billion a year subsidy. So even if you make a few more rail lines in Turkey or in... The only possible solution is to go with buses all over the city. And buses in exclusive lane. If we have a democracy, buses have to have a priority in the use of road space. Of course, there are many political battles. Battles against these informal operators. I don't think you have them here in Turkey. I have 30 seconds more. <laughs> Okay, battles against the people with cars. People with cars, they want subways. Not because they have the intention of using them mostly, but because they think the people in buses will go underground so they have more space for their cars. <laughs> so this is a wonderful solution, but this can be much improved. A system like this can be improved. You can improve the access of the buses, of course, this is a democratic symbol. It shows public transport has a priority over private cars. You have to have overpasses, so you can have express buses, overpasses at the station. This increases the capacity to five. I say, just to finish, that... Uh, look at... Two seconds more. Uh, solving Istanbul's mobility is not a technical, but a political issue. 
Look at this street in the Netherlands just for buses. If, you, if there is the political will to create hundreds of kilometers of busways in both large and small streets, mobility can be solved. This is very easy. But this is a political, it's, it's, it's very cheap, it's technically simple, but of course, it's politically difficult. But it's the only solution. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. I'm not sure how to follow on that exactly.